yeah, so as, as Sid said, um, I'm going to be taking a small step outside the box of pigments and having a look at how fluorescence might be a potential biosignature for planets that experience higher UV uh, radiation than uh, sort of more Earth-like planets. Uh, and so what I'm going to do today is to talk about how we came up with the idea of looking at fluorescence as a surface biosignature. Uh, and so the main problem we had was that a lot of the first planets that we're going to be able to characterize in the habitable zones of stars are these uh, M star planets that are very close in to their, uh, their host stars. And these M stars have, uh, can be very active. They can flare very frequently. Uh, and these flares can, are, are often in X-ray or extreme UV wavelengths or at the uh, sort of longer wavelength UV that can be uh, detrimental to any surface life that might be exposed to it. And so we want, what we wanted to, to do was to try and think of ways in which life could exist on these planets but actually still be detectable because, it, uh, because if you live on a UV bathed world in order to protect yourself, your protection mechanisms like living underground or living underwater um, don't lend themselves to us remotely detecting life. And that's where we came up with the idea of fluorescence, uh, which could be used as a sort of UV protection method, uh, which has a knock-on effect of actually, if there's enough of it and it's bright enough, could actually signal the presence of life on the surface uh, compared to these other sort of UV protection me mechanisms that life can use. Um, so we're going to start just by doing a brief overview of fluorescence uh, in the natural world. It, it is everywhere in some form. Uh, the brightness of fluorescence changes from organism to organism. Uh, it's especially prevalent in marine organisms uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, they use it for communication. Uh, they use it for, in, so, in some coral species, species, they might be using this as a UV protection mechanism, which is where we sort of got this idea from. Um, and the idea of fluorescence being a globally uh, sort of detectable surface biosignature uh, is illustrated quite well by chlorophyll fluorescence on Earth. So chlorophyll in surface vegetation fluoresces when it's exposed to uh, UV wavelengths. Uh, now this, this fluorescence effect is happening at such a low level that it's completely drowned out by the ambient light environment on Earth. Uh, but if you take surface uh, observations of the planet and you subtract the solar radiation component and this, all the, the other reflectance features so that you just leave the fluorescence behind, you get this very clear image of exactly where the vegetation is. And then this fluorescent, uh, fluorescence signature provides a good uh, indication of plant health. You can see seasons changing as vegetation loses leaves and, or regains the leaves in spring. Uh, and so it's, it's a very good marker for um, what surface vegetation on Earth is doing. It just happens to be not a very bright effect. But uh, when it comes to defining potential biosignatures, it's very good to start thinking outside the box slightly. So if you can get this kind of detectable effect from fluorescence, but at a low level, how, how much can we scale this up such that we could actually have a remotely observable fluorescent biosignature. Um, and so what we did is we took corals as an example. So corals are some of the, the sort of most well-studied fluoresces uh, in the animal kingdom. Um, and we had a, a conversation with some coral biologists who were able to give us some measurements on how coral fluorescent proteins respond to UV and blue wavelengths and how the absorption, uh, absorption and emission profiles change. Uh, and so the, the sort of very basic overview of fluorescence is you're taking in uh, high energy photons. Uh, they're absorbed by whatever molecule is, is absorbing them. Energy level of an electron is raised up. And as that electron then relaxes back down, it re-releases a photon uh, at a longer wavelength. Uh, and so this is why UV protection is one of these uh, possibilities for uh, corals and other organisms that are exposed to, that, that can be exposed to high UV, because you can take in a UV photon, which can be biologically damaging, and you can shift it to a longer and safer wavelength. Uh, 
uh, protecting uh, the sort of biological material around the fluorescent pigments, or in the case of floral, uh, uh, corals, poten potentially the uh, symbiotic algae that live, lives uh, within the coral. Uh, and so, why why is this a problem for M star planets? So, as I mentioned, they're very active stars. Uh, or they can be very active stars. And we know that certainly for the planets like Proxima b uh, um, and uh, the Trappist-1 planets, their host stars are very active uh, uh, to a point that an Earth-like planet with an Earth-like atmosphere would certainly be very affected by this. Um, the flares uh, in the EUV and X-ray X -ray wavelengths can have effects on a planet's atmosphere. They can erode away. Uh, atmospheres over time if the star is constantly flaring regularly and so you could end up with much, with much thinner atmospheres you can destroy uh, ozone in the atmosphere um, and this all can lead to higher surface UV fluxes than we get on Earth uh, and in terms of UV um, we need to start thinking about the sort of biologically relevant UV so you can split UV into uh, three different uh, sort of wavelength bands. And you, these, in terms of the biological effect they have, uh, in terms of destroying DNA or causing mutations or various other kinds of biological damage, the effect that different wavelengths of UV, UV have on organisms uh, sort of scales with decreasing wavelength. So the UVA re re region, which is most of the UV that reaches the surface on Earth, uh, is fairly benign compared to UVB, which can cause an order or two of magnitude more damage. Uh, and I'm, at the moment, I'm a walking example of this because having spent three days in San Francisco in the sun, my UVB exposure has turned me bright red. Uh, if I'd had uh, that length, that same time exposure to UVC, uh, I wouldn't be here right now. So the, these, these effects really do scale up dramatically. But on Earth, uh, so as you see, the, I've drawn in the UV surface cut off on Earth. Ozone is very good at filtering out the worst of the UV for life. Uh, so UVA and UVB can still cause damage, but the damage rate happens at a slow, uh, slow, uh, slow rate, and it, it can easily be... Uh, so they, biological organisms can easily repair themselves using various, various different methods. But if you have an M-star planet um, that is letting in more of this UV, uh, either because it has less ozone or it has a thinner atmosphere, then the surface UV um, environment can make the surface a lot more inhospitable for life. Um, now, life has various ways of protecting itself, but as I said before, these protection mechanisms like living underground or underwater aren't so good for us to then be able to detect surface biosignatures because you get sort of the reflectance spectrum of, say, sand or water mixed in with whatever it is that's living on the surface or near the surface. But fluorescence is potentially one way of getting around this. And um, so what we wanted to do is just uh, do a sort of first order of magnitude. Uh, let's have a look at how fluorescence or how much fluorescence we, could, we would need based on these coral proteins to cause a detectable signature. So we'd have the reflectance spectrum of whatever organism we're uh, modeling our surface biosphere on, which in this case we use corals because we were working with coral biologists um, and we had all the spectra from them. Uh, but this could equally work with any other kind of organism that could potentially evolve. Uh, and then we added uh, a fluorescence effect based on the coral fluorescent proteins, which gives you an increased emission to add on to the surface um, reflectance feature, which, that, which could then cause a detectable spike at a certain wavelength. Um, and so this is what we did. So we used um, a sort of a global coverage of this uh, model biosphere of corals. Uh, we added in uh, atmosphere, so an Earth-like atmosphere over the top, uh, but sort of adapted so as, as an Earth-like atmosphere would appear around an M star. Uh, and then we looked at different fractions of coverage on the surface. So we started with a whole biosphere, and then we split it up into fractions of, say, open ocean, uh, and with different cloud coverage over the top to investigate how detectable this feature would be. Uh, and so we, we, we sort of had free reign with 
deciding how strong our fluorescence could be. And so what we modeled initially as our best case scenario was fluorescence that is 100% uh, sort of efficient. So it's taking every photon that it absorbs, it re-emits. Uh, and then we assumed we had a very dense coverage and that effects sort of such as quenching, which can turn, uh, which could effectively destroy fluorescent pigments, could be reversible, which is something you can see in certain, uh, certain fluorescent proteins. And so we ran that through a model. And as you can see at the bottom there, the, these reflectance spectra are slowly adapting once we start adding layers of land, of surface, of clouds. Uh, and the sort of spike you can see just after 500, so we were looking, so the ones I'm showing here are green fluorescence proteins. Uh, this, this is the sort of, sort of like a, a bit like the, the vegetation red edge, a very large, very sudden spike in reflectance at a given wavelength. And what we could then do is plot this onto a color diagram, a color color diagram, uh, which is effectively just comparing uh, the strength of reflectance at certain wavelength bands. And so Sid is our resident color color diagram expert at the Carl Sagan Institute, and so he will uh, go into these, di uh, these diagrams in a lot more detail next, I think. Um, but the, the main thing here is to, to, to see how fluorescence affects the surface reflectance of our model planets. So when the coral biosphere is not fluorescing, uh, so we took four different example species of coral labeled A to D, which are the gray squares on this diagram. Uh, and then when fluorescence turns on, so you can imagine this as, say, uh, a large flare hits the planet, the UV levels spike, uh, the biosphere then starts fluorescing in response to this huge UV flux increase. And then as it fluoresces, it moves its position in, the, uh, in color space uh, fairly significantly. Um, and so this is the sort of detectable effect we wanted to start thinking about. So uh, a planet is, would effectively be turning itself into sort of a lighthouse-like beacon as this surface biosphere lights up. And so what I've shown here is, is the best case. So this is where we just have an entire planet, clear skies covered in uh, a fluorescent biosphere. And obviously the effect of this well, the magnitude of this change will change depending on the fraction of the surface coverage and the brightness of the effect, but this illustrates it quite nicely. Uh, and so there are other things that fluoresce. So obviously, uh, all sorts of things fluoresce. Uh, as long as you've got the right structure, you can have something that will fluoresce. Uh, and one of the things we wanted to compare to here is fluorescent minerals. Uh, but so we a lot of the fluorescent minerals that fluoresced at the same wavelength as the sort of various coral fluorescent proteins that we investigated uh, were all roughly in that area of this diagram. So they were all fairly separate. Uh, and when they were and were not fluorescing, uh, they hardly moved at all because the strength of the fluorescence effect was so low. Uh, and so we're, we're sort of using the argument here that if um, if uh, fluorescence evolved as a UV protection mechanism in whatever surface biosphere lives on these planets, uh, bright fluorescence would be favored by evolution if this is an effective protection mechanism, whereas these fluorescent minerals would not be subject to Darwinian uh, evolutionary rules, and so they would just be fluorescing at their naturally low levels. Um, and so in a way, it could be distinguishable from false positives like that, um, and there are other op op uh, possibilities, such as uh, aurora. Uh, but if you know something about the chemical composition of an atmosphere, then if you detect an auroral emission and you know that a certain molecule is present that causes that color of emission, then you could argue that, well, we can say that's not fluorescence, that's an aurora. So they, it could potentially be distinguish distinguishable from other false positives. Uh, and so this is just a quick illustration of how high the UV levels can get during a flare. So this is for a very active uh, M star, AD LEO. Uh, and the gray line there is the top of the atmosphere solar UV emission that we get on Earth. Uh, and so the star is normally uh, giving a planet at Earth's equivalent distance a much lower flux than we get on Earth. And, but when it flares, it can jump up by an order of magnitude or more in terms of the UV flux that could reach these planets. So we could get very high UV fluxes 
Uh, and one thing we've done recently, uh, Lisa and I at the Carl Sagan Institute we wrote a quick paper for the um, proximate, uh, for the TRAPPIST-1 planets to look at what UV levels they would get. Uh, and we looked at an Earth-like atmosphere and an Earth-like atmosphere that's been eroded, so much thinner, and then a, and a, then a sort of completely anoxic oxygen-free atmosphere. Uh, and so in all of these cases, so this is the oxygen-free atmosphere, you get a lot more UVC coming to the planet, so the really damaging wavelengths, but they're still at a much low le lower level than on Earth. Um, so UV protection mechanisms like fluorescence could potentially work without UVC completely destroying everything. Um, and so I'll just leave that up and I'll finish there. <laughs>